Happy New Year and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your company. Today's event is the second in our board focus series. I want to recognize and thank Chamber Board Member Stephen Revel of Freshfields, who suggested we deliver an event series on what boards are focusing on, what they should be focusing on, and what might be worrying them. The idea is to help inform existing and potential board members, and as always, to learn from one another. Our first event in this series took place late last year and covered cybersecurity and its attendant risks. Today's event and the next two will unpick environmental, social and governance, ESG risks, looking at each in turn. So today we focus on E for environmental risks. We have a panel of expert practitioners from chamber members Brunswick Group, Control Risks, and Shearman and Sterling, whose day jobs are to advise, inform, and help company leadership teams and boards to meaningfully identify, manage, and respond to environmental risks and responsibilities. Please make full use of our time together this afternoon and tap into their knowledge and expertise. That means asking questions. At any time during today's webinar, please type your questions in the Q&A box, which you will find at the bottom of your screens. If you, you also will have the capability to vote on those questions which most appeal to you. The panel conversation and dialogue with you will take place after a keynote address by Ms. Rima Bhattacharya of Control Risks. The panel will be moderated by Mr. Michael Kearns of Brunswick Group. I will be back after the dialogue to make brief closing remarks. And it is now my pleasure to invite Ms. Rima Bhattacharya of Control Risks to deliver her keynote address. Rima, please. Hello, everybody. And thank you, Victor. I hope everyone can hear me and see me OK. Um, so I'm quite excited to speak to all of you today. And I must say that as a geopolitical risk analyst, I've had an interesting couple of years examining how governments, businesses, civil societies, and capital markets negotiate issues on climate change and sustainability. So the climate crisis, a concept that was once relegated to the corners of academic debates and sleepy multilateral dialogue is finally upon us and is actively reshaping, redefining even socioeconomic realities around the world as well as uh, the rules for doing business. And all of this I think is happening at a time of immense political and institutional fragility globally what we can see is an ever increasing number of dysfunctional and vulnerable governments struggling to shore up their pandemic diminished capacity to absorb and manage both external shocks and internal challenges, both climate and otherwise. So I think for businesses, this evolving dynamic changes everything. I think with decades of government inaction and zero sum international dialogue, the pressure is now on businesses to convince a wide array of stakeholders that they are playing their part in tackling climate change as well as are ready for its impacts. Now, if you uh, unpack and focus on the impact piece for a minute, uh, we see that environmental risks today, be it from um, climate change related weather events, biodiversity loss or climate action failure, tops the global risk agenda. And Asia is very much on the front lines of climate disaster. Now, you don't need me to sort of convince uh, and, and kind of put the uh, point on the, um, on the table, but we now see mounting evidence that the escalating frequency of extreme weather events in Asia will have severe consequences for the region's uh, labor productivity, infrastructure, assets and services, and, and what have you. But uh, climate risk is yet to become a mainstream concept in macroeconomic policy and decision making. Although many policies and initiatives exist on paper, 
what we see is that most regional governments lack the political will to fully integrate climate risks into critical things like national fiscal policy strategies or even national security considerations. So in a prolonged COVID scenario, Asia's emerging markets especially will not have the fiscal space to increase spending on crucial things like strengthening the adaptive capacity of new infrastructure or even retrofitting existing critical assets to make them more resilient. So I think the biggest challenge for boards in the coming decade will be confronting the risks that runaway climate threats pose to their operations and resilience. In many cases, I think business survival is, is, is um, becoming dependent on it. But what we are seeing is that too many companies and organizations are responding to this challenge tactically, which is event by event, uh, on an event by event basis. Now, this approach ignores the complexity and the scale of uh, climate risk, I would say. I think from a preparedness perspective, businesses in Asia specifically will need to appropriately consider environmental factors in their asset level risk assessments and ensure that their assets are resilient to environmental events and uh, any resulting disruption. As part of emergency response and crisis mitigation strategies, I think companies will need to develop a thorough understanding of national and local level resources that are available to them for mobilization during a crisis situation. These, these could include things like law enforcement capabilities, rescue operations at hand, or even communication systems that, that can come online during a crisis scenario. Equally, I think companies will need to recognize the long-term costs of remaining in an area of high environmental risks, ranging from sourcing power and raw materials to the safety of their employees. And from an adaptation point of view, I think businesses especially again in Asia, will need to recognize the interconnectedness of their environmental, social, and governance footprint with their exposure to such risks. I think 2022, among other things, will kickstart the decade where climate risk, climate action, and energy transition, which of course is the grand underpinning, underpinning challenge of our time, become a mainstream, become a major implementation question for Asia's economies, industries, and businesses. Most Asian businesses I, I have seen, to, uh, and uh, perhaps including members who joined us for this session today, tend to look at these issues, especially energy transition, mainly from um, mainly as a risk that affects uh, fossil fuel sectors or oil and gas companies. But what the transition is essentially doing is that it's actively redesigning future markets and economies by replacing conventional raw materials that power them with zero emission substitutes. It is rewriting the trading principles for global as well as Asia's commodity markets, for example, which of course will have massive implications for price volatilities and inflation. So in the coming years, country level net zero commitments will define the direction of travel for uh, the world's major economies. But here again, Asia's lack of preparedness is pulling it in the opposite direction. Um, I don't see us having a realistic plan, for example, to rationalize our fragmented supply chains or create opportunities for new green goods and services. We also lack robust regulatory frameworks to implement green market mechanisms and financing models. Most green technology solutions, given how, they, how expensive they still are, remain beyond the reach of many Asian countries. The ones we have access to, such as renewable power, even EVs face massive scale-up challenges. So looking ahead, and I use this analogy quite often, if you're a company in the 2030 energy economy with operations uh, all over Asia, serving the growing needs of a global market of zero emission goods and services, chances are that all your regional units making the same products in the same way will face a perplexing assortment of climate regulations and enforcement mechanisms that differ in scope and depth from one country to another. They'll also face a number of challenges in securing greener materials and scalable climate technologies uh, amid shortages as demand for low emissions uh, solutions outstrip supply in Asian markets. 
At the same time, we'll see businesses globally and in APAD face more pressures to come up with their own net zero plans, which are both realistic and measurable. So the net zero imperative is not only shaping global and regional business priorities, but also becoming the, innov the innovation challenge of the century. Now the green globalization wave is designed to incentivize and reward early movers. In Asia, this would mean that companies that put convincing net zero plans in place, which includes things like proactively investing in decarbonization technologies, building resilience against climate risk, as we were just discussing, mitigating risks throughout ESG risks throughout supply chains, will have major competitive advantages over companies that are reluctant to act now and are looking for policies and regulations to come first. Now, companies will need capital to decarbonize and take such a big undertaking. And for that, financial institutions and governments are asking companies to disclose more and more information about their exposure to climate risks and their climate action plans. The standard approach that I have observed in the market is for most companies and our clients to disclose as little as possible, stick to the rule book, only what's legally mandated. And here's where we are advising clients to look at the bigger picture to make the most of these green um, emerging green investment trends. I think businesses must be able to accurately quantify their ESG risks and performances. But the main challenge here is that unlike financial reports, a company's ESG information has to cater to a diverse set of stakeholders, ranging from shareholders to suppliers who have competing agendas and priorities. Investors, for instance, may want uh, to understand a company's performance only from a subset of ESG topics that affect its bot bottom line. In contrast, customers might want to know about the company's broader impacts on society and the economy. So a one-size-fits-all disclosure strategy or a stakeholder engagement approach simply won't do. I want to conclude my remarks, again, uh, I think by highlighting some of the commercial opportunities here once again. I think we're definitely looking at a period where climate dynamics will shape the opportunities and risks at play on all fronts. And businesses most likely will be left on their own to navigate a very disruptive energy transformation phase, balancing competing priorities, ranging from securing energy supplies, ensuring supply chain resilience, achieving sustainability, providing value-based leadership, guaranteeing security, and even accelerating growth in a future low-carbon economy. While all of that is a challenge and it's a major source of risk, I also see immense opportunity for companies that are looking to disrupt traditional sectors with green solutions. But for that, I think ESG risks, I know we are talking about environmental risks today, but I think the whole set of ESG risks will need to be understood, managed and monitored more actively than I think they have been for generations. And on that note, I want to hand it over to Michael who will take us through the rest of the session. Thank you. Great, thank you Rima for that excellent scene setter for this panel and, and hi everyone and happy new year and, and welcome to the session. Thank you for joining. Um, just again, to remind you, if you have any questions, just drop them into the Q and A. Um, function on Zoom, and we'll pick them up as we go along. And uh, where relevant, we'll introduce them into the into the session, and then we can also hold some for, for the for the end of, of the panel. Um, just to set the scene a little bit further, you know, even from the news today, there we've learned that 2021 was one of the hottest years on record, with record levels of greenhouse gas emissions, particularly methane and carbon dioxide. That in a year where we had COP26 where a deal was finally reached on a global market for trading carbon offsets. Um, although there is still much criticism and ambiguity around what that deal means and how it gets implemented. This, while we are witnessing a transition unlike any other that we've seen in human history, it's a transition that will touch every part of our lives, how we make things, how we transport them, how we travel, how we eat and what we eat, how we run our businesses and our personal lives. And unlike previous energy transitions, which were driven largely by availability of resources and costs, this one is at least partly driven by more existential considerations and moral considerations. And it is demanding a pace of change and breadth of action we have not seen before. So given these high stakes, the enormity of the task at hand, how do boards advise businesses on what they must do while also ensuring businesses are resilient and continue to grow? 
these are some of the questions we're going to touch upon. And of course, we'll get to your questions as you put them into the chat. Um, to deal with those questions, we're going to introduce our panel now. We have, of course, you've met Rima. Rima is a senior analyst in Control Risk Singapore office. She's actively involved in expanding the business's suite of services in ESG and works alongside clients to strengthen their in-house ESG processes. From Brunswick, my good colleague, Aisha Khan. Aisha is the director at Brunswick. Um, and as part of Brunswick's regional energy and resources practice, cybersecurity and crisis offer, and plays a key role in Brunswick's global environmental committee. And the firm is committed to science-based targets to reduce our own GH GHG emissions by 2028. And last but not least, Emmanuel Jacobin. Emmanuel is a partner in the international arbitration practice for Sherman and Sterling based in Paris and Singapore. Emmanuel has extensive experience advising and representing companies, state-owned entities, and governments in international commercial and investment treaty arbitrations under all major arbitration rules with a focus on investment, oil and gas, energy, and mining disputes. Um, he's also a member of Sherman and Sterling's Energy Innovation Group, as well as the firm's ESG focus group. Welcome panelists, and thank you all for your time today and for joining us. Looking forward to the session. So one of the things that I think we need to address off the, off the bat here is how do, we how do we help businesses and how do boards help businesses understand the rather confusing array of standards, benchmarks, benchmarks and metrics that are out there? Um, they are complicated, they overlap, they often um, don't even have any correlation. When you look at the MSCI index, which is largely followed by a lot of companies, it only correlates with less than 50% of some of the other big uh, 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 metrics out there like S&Ps and Sustain Analytics, uh, the three big providers of ESG ratings. So with these kind of different confusing array of standards and metrics, how can boards advise their business leaders and executives on what they should focus on? Aisha, why don't we start with you on this one? Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, one of our favorite topics at Brunswick, and you're, you know, you're completely right, it's an absolute labyrinth of sustainability metric standards and benchmarks. Um, Rima touched on disclosure and how little we see in Asia as she concluded her keynote and certainly it is the bare minimum. Um, for this session, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the e part, the environmental and focus you know, specifically on climate. And you know, what, we, you know, what we've seen and what we advise our clients is that you know, really what companies do have control over and what we see as a starting point in terms of disclosures is TCFD aligned reporting for non-financial disclosures. Um, stakeholders increasingly want to see and demand uh, alignment to TCFD, or they want to see that um, you know, companies are working towards TCFD. Um, perhaps to take a step back, you know, the, the obvious question is why, you know, why TCFD? And um, uh, you know, that stands for the Task Force on Climate Related uh, Financial Disclosure. It's really to ensure that um, corporate strategy is stress tested against climate um, and resilient against the impact of climate and increasing regulation on carbon. Um, uh, another point I think that Rima briefly touched on is that yes, I mean, you know, we are seeing increasing regulation on carbon. Um, currently in Asia Pacific, it is, it is uh, very much voluntary in terms of TCFD, but we're seeing um, a definite shift towards governments and. Um, regulatory bodies incorporating this into, into policy. Um, and APAC is quickly following suit. I mean, in, 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 in the UK, TCFD uh, you know, line reporting is already, um, will, will be mandatory this year. We can expect to see the same in Hong Kong by uh, 2025. And um, governments in, I, I mean, ac across the region, whether it's Singapore, Japan, or Australia, strongly recommend disclosures in reference to TCFD. Um, so, you know, for, for us, uh, you know, there's some very obvious reasons why we would sort of recommend this as a starting point for our clients um, in terms of, you know, a better understanding risk assessments or capital allocation or even undertaking their own strategic planning. Um, but, uh, you know, to broaden out the discussion, but we can expect further evolution and consolidation of standards as we saw um, with the launch of the ISSB standards at COP26. And that's, uh, I think, going to be the next thing to watch for us. Thanks, Aisha. Now, Emmanuel, you have a, a different perspective on this, given your role in advising clients from a legal point of view. Perhaps I could get you to weigh in on this as well. Yeah, yes, Mike. Uh, first of all, Happy New Year. Thank, thank you, everyone, for, for being here. 
Um, yes, uh, maybe I can bring a legal perspective on, on that issue and, and, and especially on the impact of this labyrinth of rules and, and regulation on, on businesses uh, that, that some people might, might not be aware of. But, but the first thing I'd like to say is that risks and, and legal risks in relation to environment is, is not something new, it has always existed. Um, and I've been working on, on cases related to environment since the beginning of my career. What is indeed very new in these last few years is this proliferation of, of rules of all sorts. So treaties, laws, regulations, guidelines, recommendations, etc., at the national and international level. Some of them are non-binding, some of them are binding on, on companies. And, and so how do you navigate through that? Uh, that that's indeed something very new in the last few years. The second thing that is new, and, and it's directly related to these norms, is the number of litigations relying on those norms. Uh, even in just in the context of climate change, it's been reported that in May, 2020, in May 2021, there were 1,841 cases in the world related to climate change. So most of these cases uh, were actually brought in the US, in the UK, and in Australia, but there are some of those cases in Asia as well. And most of those cases were against government, but there are some cases against private corporation. So that's something to take into account. It indeed creates new risks for companies that they should take um, uh, into account. And the third thing that is very new is the scope of these cases and, and of these litigations, which create, especially in, in some recent decision, wide ranging obligations towards company. And, and a very good example of that, maybe I can say a few words about it, is a recent decision in the court, in the district court of The Hague in the Netherlands. It started in 2019. It's a group of NGOs and individuals that sued Royal Dutch Shell asking the court to declare that Shell number one had breached its duty of care towards the, the um, citizens of the Netherlands by not reducing its carbon emission. And number two, asking the court to order Shell to effectively reduce the carbon emissions by 2030. And surprisingly enough, they did win the case. The court indeed considered that Shell had breached its duty of care and number two, that Shell must reduce its carbon emission by 2030 by 45%. And the two things I think that are interesting for us in that decision is number one, that the court considered that Shell breached its obligation non on, not on the basis of binding rules in the Netherlands. Uh, there are no rules that oblige companies to reduce their carbon emission on the Netherlands, but on the basis of the soft law, non-binding principles, and in particular, the UN um, uh, principles on business and, and uh, guidelines on business and human rights. The court said, look, you have a duty of care under Dutch law. These soft law principles represent a uniform standard today internationally. You do refer yourself to those non-binding principles in your annual report and corporate communication. And therefore, we will rely on those non-binding standards to assess your duty of care as a matter of Dutch law. So you see it's very wide ranging. Uh, you would think that these international treaties only bind states, that soft law, non-binding by definition, doesn't bind company. Well, on the basis of that decision, they do. And the second point that needs to be noted in that decision is that the court considered that Shell was responsible for carbon emission, not only of itself in the Netherlands, but also of the carbon emissions of all of its subsidiaries all over the world but also of the carbon emissions of its business partners all over the world, and also of the carbon emissions of its end users. So it's extremely wide ranging. Now you'll tell me, okay, this is in the Netherlands. You know, it's, it's a big oil major company. How does that create a risk for, for boards and, and, and companies in, in Singapore? Well, it might well create a risk. And, and I think for, for two reasons, um, number one, because the reasoning that were used by the court is perfectly transferable to other jurisdictions. And in fact, there are no similar cases in civil law jurisdiction in France, for example, in the UK and Australia. And number two, because that reasoning is not limited to the oil and gas uh, industry. And as a matter of fact, you have similar cases um, that were brought against other types of businesses in other industries, for example, the meat and dairy industries. A an example, uh, very recent, 2020 in France, a case brought against a supermarket chain, Casino, because Casino is buying beef from a producer in Brazil, which 
is involved or alleged to be involved in illegal deforestation in Brazil. And so the, 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 the plaintiff said, look, you knew about this or you should have known about that. You have not acted upon it. And therefore that's a breach of your duty of care. So it's extremely wide ranging. Uh, it's very well possible that those types of litigation could make their way to Singapore in the next future. And that's, that obliges company to look at those environmental risks in a fundamentally different way than what they used to do in the past. As Rima says, it's not, no longer a tick the box of the rules book exercise. It's much, uh, much, much more wide ranging than that. Thanks, Manuel. And Rima, one point that I'd like to bring over to you from to building on what Emmanuel said is, and what Aisha said is, so now you have not just the complicated metrics and standards and benchmarks to navigate, there's also the, the very real risk to the business through litigation, through reputation, and, and you know, other, other things that are existential risks. What is the risk of paralysis? When you look, when, if, if companies look at this and they think, we don't know where to start, we don't know what to do, so maybe let's sit it out and, and see how things develop. What's the risk of that, the risk of paralysis? That's a very interesting question, Michael. I think the risk of paralysis is to just be waking up to an avalanche of, of, of all kinds of risks, whether it's litigation or court cases, you know, even civil unrest for that matter in, in your on the ground operations uh, two years down the line. So I think Aisha and, and, and Emmanuel both spoke about this, but what we see uh, happening is um, in Asia, things are, get even more complicated is because of the challenges of accessing quality data. Like what is all of this, you know, the global uh, fragmented reporting regime is kind of based on voluntary reported data. It's also kind of, and, and, it, and, and if you see the second tier of data aggregators, third party risk providers, they're all kind of drawing information where they compare company to company that also public, public reported companies on what is voluntary reported data. Now, as we know, I mean, it, the rules of business and the rules of investments in Asia is even more complicated. So how do you access what is actually happening on the ground? So if you, if you set up, so a lot of our, Aisha spoke about TCFD, a lot of our clients come and say, how do we, you know, TCFD is kind of imagined from a global perspective, which is a great, I mean, it, it's a good thing to start off with, but how do we kind of localize that? How do we use, I mean, how do we uh, capture the complexities of doing business in Asia using those, um, those kind of um, that globally imagined metrics. And I think this is where one of the biggest risks uh, for businesses in Asia are. So because Asian regulators are doing so little to define their own taxonomies, to come up with their own qualifications of what is green, what is not green. Now, what that, the, the, the risk of that is that, you know, EU, for example, is leading the charge on this. And, and if that kind of parameter, uh, is, is a very stringent one to set on Asia. So you, you're kind of comparing apples to oranges here. But to come, come back to your question on where do companies start? So we are doing some very interesting work with clients, big publicly listed companies with complex exposure to go global supply chains exactly on this. So we, we're, we're kind of helping them map, okay, where is this scenario going? So let's break it up, look at environmental regulations, look, different, look at different aspects of it. And, and look at what the scenarios are globally and for Asia and what your exposure is. So I feel like for a lot of our big businesses, it is to go back to the drawing board, come up with a strategy and, and do that whole complex supply chain analysis, which is cost intensive, time intensive, but it is a worthy one-time effort, which kind of, you know, it'll pivot your business to adjust to new risks in the next sort of 30, 40 years. So it's a one-time big investment, but a very significant one, which I think companies should very seriously take. Yeah, thanks, Rima. And that, that actually gives us an opportunity to bring in a question from the floor, which is, you know, how do businesses incorporate a, an environmental or sustainability risk on existing enterprise risk management frameworks or ERMs? Um, do they have to start from scratch or and reevaluate their whole ERM? Or is there an opportunity to build on what they have and and embed sustainability and environment into that framework? I show, Perhaps you can lead us off on this one. I think uh, most advisors would always say that, you know, you always start with what you've got. There's no point starting from scratch. You've got to build with the basis of, you know, what, what's already existing. I mean, I think what 
um, you know, what we've seen is that, you know, you've got guiding principles of traceability and of transparency. Um, and when you're looking at this from a climate perspective, um, you know, usually that starts with formulating a climate policy and, you know, there's the benchmarking exercise that you go through. Um, and again, I'm taking a very narrow lens sort of, you know, of, of climate and environment over here. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the benefit of starting off with a framework like TCFD is that you're evaluating your material risks along the way. Um, the question from there is where you build from there. And what we've seen from, you know, from, our, from, from key stakeholders, um, not just investors, but, you know, also, you know, NGOs and across the value chain is that target setting becomes increasingly important over here. And we're looking at short term targets and medium term targets. Increasingly, this is also moving in the direction of science-based targets, you know, setting very clear science-based targets um, that are published, that are validated by the science-based targets initiative, and then demonstrating progress against those in short, um, you know, over short periods. Um, I, I, I appreciate it's a lot easier for firms like Brunswick to undertake uh, a, a journey like this than, than some of the more sort of resource intensive industries that, you know, that, that, that characterize, you know, large parts of Asia, especially where land use and supply chains are incredibly complex um, and very long. And frankly, um, you know, we're just beginning to make inroads in the traceability of these uh, supply chains down to, you know, plantation or land or um, mill. Um, but I think, you know, for, for, from our perspective, that's very much the starting point. I think just to add to what Aisha said, um, a good starting point, I think, for our for companies, at least what that's what we're advising. I think companies over time have been uh, reporting material financial risk. They also have in-house corporate social responsibility as well as compliance mechanisms. So a good undertaking would be a gap assessment versus where you compare what you capture information-wise in-house, what have you been capturing over the years and where is the regulation involving? So where do you where do you have to scale this up? So that gap assessment is a good starting point where you know, okay, these are the material, I mean, financial risks that we've captured and the non-financial information that we've been reporting incrementally along the side. And this is what more we need to do. So taking stock of what you do already and the risks uh, that you've been reporting to investors and businesses and then seeing where the gap is and, and how much you need to scale that up, I think is, is, is a good starting point. It's something that you know, can be kicked off at a corporate strategy level. Great. Well, one of the areas that, that seems also problematic in terms of the discussion on, on where to start is the issue around offsets and, and carbon offsets. You know, there is, you know, it seems for some, it's a problematic solution because it's mitigation rather than reduction in terms of carbon footprint. Um, maybe I could get, get your views on, on that, uh, Emmanuel, if you have a view on that first, please do jump in. Yeah, yeah yes, yes, Michael. Um, I, I mean, indeed, there has been quite a few debate on um, you know, how to offset uh, this engagement of, 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 of activities that are, that are said to be um, uh, not environmental friendly or, or affect the carbon footprint. Um, and, and, and from a legal perspective as well, um, th there are a number of risks that are associated to this. As we've seen, not engaging or at the very least not considering these type of strategies uh, has uh, entailed a number of legal risks that companies need to take into account. But on the other hand, um, these divestment strategies also entail in and of themselves a number of, of legal risks. Um, and it's not enough to, for a company to decide to uh, disengage in some activities. Uh, they also need to take into account, based on the reasoning of, of the court that we have considered, they could be held liable on the basis of that duty of care for not having followed through their, their divestment. And, and there's an interesting case in that respect, a recent case in, in, in the UK, uh, the, the Marin case, where a ship builder had sold the ship for demolition to, uh, to, to uh, sorry, uh, a ship broker had sold the ship to a buyer for demolition in, in Bangladesh. And, and, and so there was a contract between the ship broker and, and, um, and, uh, and the buyer. The ship was sent to, to Bangladesh for demolition uh, and, and the shipyard in which the ship was sent happened to not be complying with environmental regulation and health regulation. And during the process of demolition, one of the workers fell to his death. And so the widow 
sued the, um, the ship broker in the UK, alleging that the ship broker had failed to comply with its duty of care because he didn't make sure that the ship would be dismantled in proper environmental and social condition. And we don't have a decision in the court on that, but uh, what the court said is that at least this is arguable and that the, the case could proceed uh, despite the fact that the builder was a complete third party. And, and what's interesting is that the court said, you should have as a ship broker, not only sold your ship, despite the fact that there was a clause in your contract saying that the ship should be brought in, in a proper shipyard, you should have made sure that the ship should be, will be dismantled properly, including in making sure that your payments will be linked to a proof by your buyer that the ship will be dismantled properly in a correct environmental and social condition. So again, this is very wide ranging. It's not enough when companies decide to divest their activity to basically transfer the hot potato to someone else. But there are a number of obligations in terms of due diligence that that company must follow through in, in that respect. Thanks, Manuel. Well, on the subject of, of divestment, there is quite a debate around whether the right approach to, um, especially from financial institutions and asset managers, is divestment or engagement. You know, we've seen a recent report uh, by uh, the Global Fossil Fuel Divestment Commitments Database counted nearly 1,500 institutions have now committed to some form, some form of fossil fuel divestment. Um, and that's looking at almost $40 trillion under management from those firms. Um, other studies suggest that divestment actually doesn't work, that the results suggest that to have an impact instead of divesting, socially conscious investors should invest and exercise the rights of control to change corporate policy, so engagement. Um, Aisha, what's your view on the divestment versus engagement debate? Um, actually, I'm going to quote a few Brunswick views that we've gathered here. Um, we, I think we had a, a, a panel a couple of weeks ago that touched on the topic, and there are definitely a few trends that we see. Um, and, and this is, you know, this is sort of in sync with the huge evolution that we've seen in the debate around climate. Um, firstly, this has shifted from being an engagement topic that, you know, about two years ago was more about engaging and, you know, getting progress updates and having informal conversations between asset uh, managers and their, you know, their large invested, uh, their larger investee companies. Um, Brunswick had actually done an, in, uh, an, uh, an investor survey of the world's largest asset managers um, at the onset of the pandemic and, you know, had, had reconfirmed that this was very much an engagement topic. But over the last two years, I think it's shifted from being a topic of engagement to a voting issue. Um, and we can see from you know, the published voting uh, records of the world's largest asset managers that directors are absolutely being uh, held accountable if they feel that companies aren't moving fast enough in the right direction when it comes to climate. Um, and you're also seeing you know, the same asset managers voting in tandem with shareholder proposals um, you know, a, a multiple of numbers and percentages, you know, compared to a couple of years ago. I think the, the, the second trend that we've seen, and, you know, this, this, this touches on um, sort of the divestment uh, um, issue you raised. I mean, there, there, there has been a shift in capital allocation um, with much greater inflows for ESG funds. Um, and ultimately, I mean, you know, we, we, this, is, this is a very, very long-term trend that we don't see losing steam anytime soon, but new capital is going to companies with good ESG credentials or a strategy on climate. And the incentive for these, you know, companies is that, you know, the cost of capital keeps going down and valuations keep increasing. So, um, you know, starting off with, you know, clearly defined climate policy is probably, you know, uh, top of mind for both, um, particularly in this region. Rima, what's your view on the, the divestment versus engagement? I think the general direction, yes, I think the general direction is, um, I mean, I see DFIs, big listed companies increasingly com coming under pressure, come under pressure to remain engaged rather than divest. And one of the lenses that I've applied recently on is how much this divestment is a trigger for the current global energy crisis and crunches and, and shortages. So we've reached a situation now where investments or divestments in fossil fuel sectors has sort of rapidly uh, sort of declined. But at the same time, we don't have renewable 
energy solutions that can be scaled up. So there is a situation where the world is over-reliant on natural gas as a transition fuel, which is again triggering its whole set of cyclical energy shortages. Now that's a real concern for regulators, for governments, for businesses in general. So I think we'll have more situations where, uh, of course, DFIs come under increasing pressure to not divest and remain engaged, set up strong KPIs for companies and may help them make that transition. Now that's easier said than done in Asia, where again, access to real information on ground intelligence on what the, the company is actually doing to uh, sort of, you know, making you, you, how is it utilizing some of the transition funds, all of that, the corruption involved in it, the, the, you know, the political patronage systems that are developing, all of that becomes relevant. And to capture that information in a decision useful manner is, is I think going to be a challenge. So, so no, no simple straightforward answers there. Manuel? Maybe one, one thing to, to add uh, on, on engagement, Michael, because a lot of these projects in which companies are, are investing that are said to be sustainable uh, are also dependent uh, on uh, very often incentives proposed by a government in, in various countries uh, in favor of you know, solar, wind energy. And, and there's a risk as well here because very often these policies are extremely volatile. And they are part of, of the financial planning of, of investors. And, and, and we saw that recently a lot in, in Italy, in Spain, or, or in the Czech Republic. Um, in particular, in, in the years 2000, Spain introduced a lot of incentives to attract investors to invest in the solar and wind industry. And it worked because they attract billions of investments of, of dollars in that sector. But 10 years down the road, Spain realized that it was too costly for them. And so they repelled the incentive. And of course, that had a huge impact on the profitability of the investment made by, by those investors at the time. So the good news here is that for most foreign investors investing abroad, there are investment treaties that protect against this type of risk, against legislative changes that tremendously impact the investment of investors. And indeed, a lot of, you saw a lot of cases in Spain in Italy and in the Czech Republic at that time, precisely on that reason. The bad news is that it doesn't work all the time. And it's only in very specific circumstances, depending on how the investment has been made, depending on the guarantees that were given by the local governments in respect of those instances that foreign investor can bring those claims. So in most of those cases actually worked. Uh, investors got damages for the repayment of, of those incentives, but it didn't work all the time. So if if that's something that concerns um, uh, companies operating in Singapore, uh, it, it's important to take special advice in, in that respect and make sure that the investment meets the conditions that allow them to be protected by those types of treaties. Right. And that is a very confusing thing for investors to navigate because for, for example, with MSCI ratings, um, it doesn't actually take much to upgrade your ESG rating on MSCI's index. Here's a, here are a few examples of the things that can, up, that can give you an upgrade. Conducting an annual employee satisfaction survey, allowing employees to report grievances, excluding the use of toxic chemicals in your products, adopting a recycling policy, um, and setting an emissions target, but actually with no need to include scope three emissions. So it's a very wide range of things that you can do to get an ESG upgrade, some of them more significant or less significant than others. When investors are looking at businesses and companies that they are potentially interested in as a, as a sustainable play in the market, what are the kinds of things that they can look for that are red flags? What are the red flags um, in terms of um, whether or not a company is walking walk when it comes to its sustainability commitments. Anyone want to take that first? No one? Okay. Maybe we'll leave that as a, as a question to consider for, for later. Um, in terms of one of the things that's interesting, and I think you alluded to this, Emmanuel, is the debate around fossil fuel performance and renewables and, and financial inflows to both. 2021 was an interesting year in, of course, there is a pickup in economic activity um, as we manage to, to live with COVID and, and manage, you know, emerge from severe lockdowns in some parts of the world. 
Um, in 2021, oil and gas uh, shares eclipsed the stock market's ESG focused companies um, by quite a large margin. Um, you know, some of the, the, the traditional fossil fuel companies were up in the multiples of 37, 40% in terms of share price, while renewables were, were up much less than that, sort of in the, in the 20% range. How do we reconcile this disconnect between you know, what is happening in terms of public discourse? These are the things we should be doing as a society, as businesses, as nations, versus what's actually happening or seems to be happening in the markets and in, in the economies. Um, Rima, would you like to pick it up first, please? Um, I think my initial thoughts, um, Michael, would be that I think government policy plays a big role in this. I think we have a situation where government policy favors fossil fuels in terms of incentives and subsidies predominantly even as it sort of has, you know, verbal support towards towards um, renewable energies, I think that is also one of the big reasons why renewable energy is uh, is also, I mean, faces such massive scale up challenges. So the the areas where governments need to inc incentivize more investments, for example, like issues like storage, scale up, the governments are not doing that. Uh, India is, in fact, thinking of, you know, uh, for example, just got doing away with its bare minimum carbon tax that already exists to help companies adapt and, and shore up money to, to buy transition technologies. So that kind of you know, messaging from the government, which is on one hand, they, you, you're all about green hydrogen and, and all technologies of the future, but at the same time, you're actively just sort of still incentivizing um, through uh, an area of subsidies and so on and so forth, fossil fuels. I feel like that itself is a big, it, it's, it's a confusing thing and that's it's a confusing message to send to markets and businesses. And that could probably be a reason why we see there's a big gap where in, in, in you know, investment in renewables versus, versus fossil fuels. Thanks, Rima. Aisha? Um, so actually, this is a really interesting one. Um, and uh, Energy and Resources Practice has done a lot of research um, and ha has a few points of view on this. I mean, I think, what we saw in 2021 in terms of um, you know, performance of the oil and gas in the energy sector was uh, a bit of a perfect storm of conditions. Um, there were, um, you know, the demand was at all times, at an all time high in some ways, there was, you know, chop in changes in the supply chain, um, you know, recovery from COVID came about a lot faster than some governments anticipated inflation was lower. And then, you know, there were just some, you know, some um, um, bellwether events. I mean, it was a very cold winter. There were, you know, supply disruptions. So, you know, the, I, I think the, you know, the price of commodities and, you know, oil and gas in particular were pushed to unnatural highs in 2022. Um, and given, you know, underinvestment um, in the sector and less m and activity um, further up the chain, upstream, um, there was a lot of cash and, and you know, these companies, a number of companies, not necessarily across the board, but a, a few just form, performed exceptionally well, um, which was reinvested, given back as dividends, et cetera. So I think, you know, the outperformance that we saw in this sector was um, a bit of a perfect storm of, you know, 2022. Um, how long, you know, that, that, um, that trend will continue is, you know, is, is debatable, but I think, you know, the sense that, you know, ESG um, funds will outperform over the long term is still unchanged. Um, just, just, just one point I want to go back to that, you know, that Rima had touched on, which was on the issue of subsidies and, and, and separate to that innovation. I think, you know, what, um, what we're seeing some of, um, what, what we're seeing in the sector also is that, you know, as some of the, you know, oil and gas and commodity companies, um, have sort of a, a, a additional cash flows, particularly in the back of last year, there's actually more money for investment in innovative and green technology. And it, it's very much sort of an ecosystem approach that needs to be adopted to this because it can't be, I mean, whether it's, you know, green hydrogen or carbon capture utilization and storage, it, it's almost the entire ecosystem as a whole needs to sort of co-fund and co-develop this. And we're seeing this with some of our clients in certain markets already. Um, so overall, I mean, I think, you know, we see some, um, I think some, you know, some, some, some positive trends on the back of strong performance in 2022 of the sector. 
um, and, 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 and don't necessarily think this is deviating in any way from you know, the transition that we are inevitably on. Quick follow-up, Aisha. When you say that there are some markets that are doing better by creating these ecosystems for innovation, um, are you able to name names? Are there any that you would call out as doing particularly uh, well? Uh, no, I think that they're, they're the clients of ours, um, but certainly we've seen some, you know, some interesting work being done um, in carbon capture and storage um, with, you know, some clients. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean specific companies. I meant markets or jurisdictions. Uh, Australia. I think we're seeing some interesting work in Australia. Great. Emmanuel, Rima, are there any other shining examples that you think other countries uh, can aspire to when it comes to creating the right conditions for investment? in renewables? I mean, I, sorry to beat the harbinger of doom here, but I, I am, I mean, I'm looking closer to home in Asia and I, I don't see any shiny examples if I'm being honest and straightforward, but I don't know, Emmanuel, you may have some other views. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't really have other shiny examples. And in fact, it also has, uh, and it was discussed in, in a legal context in, in relation to the fiduciary duties of, in particular, it was discussed in the context of fiduciary duty of, of pension funds manager and as to how they discharge their duty of acting in the best interest of the company when they make decisions on investment. Um, and, and whether the best interest of the company is it purely the economic interest or should they take into account precisely environmental but also social uh, considerations into account when they make their investment decision at the risk of creating a loss for the company or investing in products that that brings uh, returns that that would be lower than traditional products and uh, and it, it's given rise to quite a few debates um, and it's interesting the evolution in the 80s uh, the courts when they ruled on that were very clear especially in the uk that the fiduciary duty is purely to act in the best interest of the company and there was this case where a trustee wanted to take into consideration social and ethical consideration in the investment decisions. And the court said, no, you would be in breach of your fiduciary duties if you were to take this into account because you would not be acting in the best economic interest of the beneficiaries. And this has evolved completely today. Um, uh, there's no doubt that as part of the duty now, pension fund managers, trustees, directors on boards must take this consideration in, into account at the risk of being held liable um, uh, for a breach of, of their duty of care. But then the question is to what extent, where do you draw the line and, and, and to what extent could you be accused of creating loss by insisting on those considerations? And frankly, the case law is, is very unclear uh, in that respect at the time. What, what is certain is that these considerations must be taken into account uh, today but 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 it's it's still pretty much a very gray area. Yeah. That's interesting. There's actually I, I saw today one of the principal shareholders in Unilever has come out and said that the company is actually doing damage to itself by going too far in its ESG commitments, which struck me as surprising. But it also brings back home the at its core the fundamental notion that the shareholders and investors are looking for profits and, and value um, for their investments and not necessarily um, ESG commitments. And, you know, Rima, I think you were gonna jump in on, on uh, what Emmanuel had just said. Um, no, Michael, I think you're absolutely right. I think the whole concept of ESG is thinking about long-term risks, whereas our capital markets business as you have the rules of business are completely set up on short termism it's about quarterly results quarterly performance which kind of has a, a, a chain effect on how much investment and confidence there is in companies so to shift from that mindset of of you know from short termism to long termism is a huge sort of a I think it's a skills challenge, it's a leadership challenge and it's also a management challenge and an innovation challenge very very honestly. And in terms of just jumping back to your, your other question about you know, creating an ecosystem. Now, this can't happen. Businesses can't do this in vacuum. They can't course correct in vacuum. There has to be policy promise and some sort of regulatory certainty to kind of do it in, in, and, and, and charge on with it. But the way I see uh, you know, 
again, governments in Asia responding to this is they're, they're looking at green technologies, they're looking at this promise of these new green markets from primarily from, a, from an investment point of view. So they understand that in a post-pandemic world where traditional investments have died down, this is an opportunity to create a new asset class and you know um, fill up their coffers. And so they're more, I think, concerned about how to tax some of these emerging tech technologies, how to create rules of market entry that favor them and then helps create them create a domestic industry on the back of it, which of course gives them political dividends and socioeconomic dividends. So in this, uh, you know, well, th this might be a good idea, but the thing is that I see governments and regulators specifically completely sort of overlooking some of the ESG impacts of some of the technologies that come to bear already. So if you take large renewable projects, for example, solar or, or even, even wind, they have massive community impacts and, and you know, they're displacing large masses of people, land allocation is complicated. They're creating their own array of ESG problems and risks, which the governments are going to sort of pass down to companies. So it's the company's name on the line when it comes to rep reputational dollar damage or, or, or you know, bright headlines uh, against the company. So I feel like it's, it kind of comes back uh, as a legacy risk problems for, for, for companies. So it's a cyclical effect where I feel like, you know, where you, of course you have to think about long-term risk, but holistically, and you, you kind of have to look at all the aspects of where you're investing, the country context, the socioeconomic realities of the place, whenever you're kind of investing in a renewable technology or, or an ESG strategy on the ground. Thanks, Rob. I'd like to bring in, bring in a question from our audience um, that, that relates to this. So is, is, does this mean that ESG is a counterintuitive space where first movers directed by boards and ahead of government policy must accept short-term costs in order to be long-term leaders? Aisha, would you like to start? I think if you're looking in the context of, uh, you know, of, of Asia and, you know, the point that Rima made about, you know, communities and we're getting outside of environment more into the social elements. Um, it is, it, 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 it's, it, it, it's short term, but it's also long term costs because community engagement is a very, very time intensive, um, resource intensive effort um, that takes, I mean, generations to change. I mean, if you're looking at practices, just you know, agricultural practices uh, that dominate Indonesia and Malaysia, for example. Um, first of all, you know, I think we touched on traceability earlier of supply chains, but tracing down to a plantation or an individual smallholder level, understanding what the issues are on the ground, meaningfully creating social programs and, 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 and executing sort of capacity building with you know the right stakeholders of each you know village society or whatever it takes years it's not um it's it, it's definitely not a, a, a i think a short-term fix and I, I think the only point that i would add to rima's is that there are short-term costs there are long-term costs and it takes a, a a really long-term commitment um which is you know which is where i think the more progressive companies and you know the winners if you know if we're going if, if we're going to separate the winners from the losers it's the, it, it, it's going to be about where boards are, you know, properly looking at their scope three, um, and that that you know that involves the full breadth of the supply chain and the value chain, and 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 ensuring that it's traceable down to you know the level of the land in you know in terms of sort of you know social for um, you know many of the industries that we uh, see sort of you know taking up a, a, a lot of Asia you know Pacific efforts and and GDP. And maybe just to add to what Ayesha said, I think ESG regulations, if, if you're looking at it from a policy and regulations level, it may seem a bit counterintuitive right now. But the thing is that I must stress, there is a wealth of information that private sector can draw on. And I think mm -hmm. that's one of the issues that we wanted to discuss about having the right talent in your organization and having the right people lead your ESG strategy as you go into this you know, new uncharted territory. There is a lot of uh, information on how you do this. How do you do, sort of navigate scope three? Where do you start? So it, for, for businesses, I think, who would lead the race, it's about amalgamation, assimilating some of the best ideas, picking the ones that are most relevant to their supply chain and, and, and obviously putting, putting money behind it. Um, but yes, I don't, what I would like to say is you, that you will not get that kind of direction from governments or policies anytime soon. 
And if I, I could add to that, I, I completely agree with all of this, but I would say it's, it's not only a question of long-term objective and, and, and being leaders by incurring short-term costs today, I would say there's a very real risk for companies uh, today not taking into account those issues and acting upon those issues, um, both in terms of what we've discussed, you know, public interest litigation, litigation by shareholders being held accountable by the regulators, but also by their consumers, by the media. Mm -hmm. so, so by thinking that all of this is long-term, uh, it, it, it would definitely be a mistake. There's a very short-term risk here, both legal and economic. And as Aisha says, it also takes time to implement those policies. And, and the risk will keep increasing in, in the next few years, uh, as long as the regulations keep, keep following through. And, and companies that are not prepared for that, they will certainly have to pay the cost uh, in, in a couple of years or even, even uh, in a shorter time frame than that. I'd like to pick up on a point. Reem has raised about talent and expertise. Um, I think what we're seeing generally is a gap in terms of the expertise and knowledge at the board level when it comes to sustainability. Um, a recent study by INSEAD and, and Hedrick and Suttles uh, struggles says that you know three quarters of board directors that they survey globally now believe climate change is a central issue for their company's long-term success. However, only half said the subject was properly integrated into their businesses' investment decisions and that the board still need to increase their climate knowledge significantly. Um, how do we address that talent gap? Typically, people who have deep backgrounds in sustainability don't necessarily have deep experience running businesses or companies or on board level um, uh, roles. Um, and often, as we've said, as we've just seen with that survey, people with that kind of deep business experience don't have the knowledge on sustainability issues. How do we address that, that talent gap, Rima? I think, uh, Michael, I think a good start, again, I, and I've seen this with, I think, my company with several others. The idea is, um, everybody gets confused and then they put out, you know, uh, great job descriptions or things up. they want to hire, recruit people with deep sustainability knowledge, which like you very rightly pointed out, don't understand businesses. There's very little focus on actually upskilling people within your business who really understand everything as, as, as it relates to your business, but also have that aptitude for understanding a wide array of ESG risks. So I think there has to be more focus on upskilling. And, and I'm often very surprised at how much my clients, even at board level, are speaking to people on the ground, are, are, are having converse, intelligent conversations with people with that kind of background, picking up that knowledge, you know, surrounding themselves with experts or, or speaking with experts so to pick up on the knowledge. So I feel like that conversation has to evolve, but it's, it is very much, from my point of view, an element of educating your own self. And as, a, as an analyst who's sort of covered non-financial risks, I think, for over a decade, I've had, I mean, it's, it, I've seen challenges firsthand on how you know, you convince a board level audience on how to quantify non-financial risks. And ESG is literally the most, it's like the mega universe of non-financial uh, risks and how they emerge and, and kind of com interplay with, with, with complex issues uh, at a country level. So, I mean, I would say it's not just about getting, you know, new talent and uh, with deep uh, sustainability backgrounds, but also educating yourself as well as people within your company who show that potential. So maybe I can just add a, a few points to what uh, Rima's already laid out so well. I mean, yes, uh, you know, it's ad, it is about adding client, clim a climate change expertise to the boardroom, um, plus a sort of process, of process of ongoing board education. But, you know, the board also has access, and, and that's both independent as well as non-independent directors. They do have access to their management um, who are, you know, experts in their field and are there to sort of manage risk. So, I think you know the, the, there are a few steps. I mean, one is ensuring that um, you know that this proper identification of material risk in terms of climate and that it's on the risk re register. If if that's managed well, I mean, it's it's obviously in the board's interest because it leads to a better cost of capital as well. And the next step, I, I'm sorry to keep going back to it, but it goes back to disclosures. Um, and then you know, on the flip side of it, when you know what your material risks are and they're properly measured and disclosed. 
you know, the, the, the next part is also about linking, um, you know, KPIs to executive compensation. And, you know, you've got sort of disclosure and metrics and action and results. And it, 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 it creates almost a virtuous cycle. And, 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 and that really starts, you know, from, um, you know, from, from the board and is directed by the board. And maybe I can add to that, that Michael and, and particular Ramos point that that it's essential for for boards to get acquainted and and understand these issues. It, it has a legal implication, uh, specifically in in Singapore, in the UK, but also in Singapore. Um, the directors have a fiduciary duty and and also a duty of care um, towards their companies, and that duty of care includes making sure that they understand, take into account, and act upon environmental risk that can create uh, difficulties for their companies. And, and this is at the risk of civil or criminal liability. And, and the important point to note is that that standard is not lowered by any decreases in the individual's lack of knowledge or expertise in those issues. It doesn't work. So you cannot say, I don't know about that risk. Uh, this is not my expertise. I don't understand. Well, you should have known, or at least you should have taken advice from people who know about it, and therefore you are liable. So it's indeed absolutely essential for boards and directors to uh, understand those issues and, and tackle them seriously. And, and, and here I would say that from a legal perspective, the, the general counsel, the legal team of, of companies is, is essential in assisting in that process. Um, I would say maybe in, in four respects, one, identifying and monitoring the risk. And, and we've seen that it's much broader than just a box ticking exercise of, okay, what's the law? Do I comply with the law? It's much broader than that. Two, helping devising policies that identify the risk, understand the risk, and also help the company act upon those risks. Three, being able to react to an environmental crisis or, or an environmental litigation. And, and fourth, and, and maybe that's the, the, the most Im important and also recent, is being able to advise the company on decisions that will impact the future of that company. In what assets should I invest? Should I divest? Uh, what type of financing would I be able to obtain in the future, depending on my environmental profile? Uh, what type of due diligence should I carry on my business partner, supply chain, consumers, etc.? So that's something that is very new for legal teams. And it's also an era in, in which boards are not used to require, require the assistance of their legal team. So I think it requires two things. One, that boards really insist on their legal teams to be fully involved in, in those decisions, including strategic decisions, uh, long-term decisions of the company. And two, that their legal team be trained uh, in those issues and, and properly advised. And, uh, and, and here, like most, most of my co-panelists and myself, we can, of course, help. We have people specialized in, in, in those issues covering all industries and, and, and practices. So we can provide training, we can help identify the risk and, and also set up tools to properly address those risks in, in the future. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, during this conversation, there have been a few allusions to Asia lagging behind when it comes to sustainability and, uh, and uh, businesses and, 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 and even governments in the region um, finding a way to lead. Let me, let me try and turn this into a more positive uh, forward-looking spin, what are the areas where Asia could lead when it comes to sustainability? Rima, you, you are a self-proclaimed cynic. Let's start with you. Michael, I think simple answer here, and I've been thinking long and hard on this question, but perhaps not so much, but um, I think infrastructure, climate resilient infrastructure, what we, what we also forget is so much of Asia is still left to be constructed and there's so much opportunity to build more climate, I mean, completely reshape the way cities are, are being planned right now because there's so many more to come up. So just by the fact that, you know, the demographic dividend is so high and then, then I mean, it's Asia is itself going through its own sort of uh, social dynamic sort of changes. I think, again, just the possibility of creating new in climate resilient infrastructure, since we were talking about environmental risks, would be a big, big, uh, big opportunity. Things like, again, emerging sectors, whether it's hydrogen, whether it's biofuels, these are niche new sectors. There's so much opportunity in markets, in, in densely packed consumer markets in Asia. So if you set the rules of the game right and it's something that really works, which gives financial as well as ESG dividends, uh, 
it's it's one of the best markets, best regions for for testing out some of the best some of the new technologies, emerging technologies. I mean, if anything, renewables has shown how much it can be scaled up, even in markets as fragmented in in Asia. So those would those would be my top two. Thank you, Rima. Aisha, where would you say that Asia has opportunities to lead on this? I think Rima made some excellent points, so it's hard to follow up on those. But I think in addition to new infrastructure and how you, you know, you plan cities, it's also to a degree, I think, you know, we've we've got to work with the infrastructure that we have and filling the gaps that, you know, that currently exist. Um, you know, there are a lot of cool assets um, in, you know, in emerging markets uh, across the region that um, need upgrading um, because they're nowhere close to being, you know, to being retired at this point. Um, and the same could be said for power grids across the region. Um, so I would just build on Rima's point to say that, you know, in addition to new infrastructure, it's it's improving and strengthening um, and I, I guess introducing redundancies where we can with with the infrastructure that we've got. Thanks, Aisha. Emmanuel, you straddle both Asia and Europe in your role. Also, do you see areas where Asia could be a leader on this? Yeah, no, I'll be a lawyer again here and pick up on, on Rima's point. I, I think in, in terms, it's quite interesting because all of these issues and, and norms on regulations, uh, for once, didn't come from, mostly didn't come from national governments and laws, but came from soft law, international treaties, everything we've discussed. And that's the reason why it's so difficult to navigate, coming back to our, to our first question. And, and really, I think what would help is for governments in Asia to develop a normative framework on which companies could rely precisely to know how to navigate and to make decisions in the future instead of potentially being held accountable on you know, the basis of very vague uh, principle or, or instruments that they thought would not be binding on them. So, so, so there were some um, uh, legislation frameworks that, that have been adopted or proposed in, in Europe uh, recently and as Rima said, they're not necessarily adapted to the Asian context. So that's definitely where an era where Asian countries uh, in general and, and Singapore in particular could take the lead to make sure that you know, this normative framework exists for companies in, in Asia and that it is adapted to the realities of, of the Asian market. So definitely that would help. Picking up on one of the, the questions from our audience, um, what is the scope for industry to work with governments in the region or even regional bodies like ASEAN to create standards or co-create standards and then transparent reporting processes. Should I do? Sure, sort please of go ahead. Take it? Okay, uh, I would say, I think that's one of the areas that, that's, that's, that's one of our key pieces of, you know, advice to clients. We see, especially in Southeast Asia and South Asia and, and generally emerging markets, there's tremendous appetite for government functionaries and even departments to work with the private sector to to develop these kind of standards and rules uh, for for certain sectors, what we see is that there's also an immense talent talent crunch on the government side. Uh, you know the technocrats that are there, the people who are kind of leading portfolios uh, in 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 for example Indonesia, India, Vietnam. They don't really understand the full array and complexity of environmental risk. So as I was saying, they have no idea how to sort of frame those rules. What is anti-competitive? How do we even go about this? How do you set those standards locally? And I think this is one of the biggest pieces. I mean, it's a huge education opportunity for, for clients, for big listed companies also. So that way they also get to set the rules in a way that also works for them. So. And again, it's not a lot is happening, um, even at business associ association levels, where you know information is aggregated and that's communicated to government stakeholders. And there's some, and 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 you know, in, when it comes to capacity building, for that matter. So I'd say immense opportunity. It's probably the best way forward. Aisha or Manuel, do you have a view on that? working with governments or regional bodies on standards? I think the difficulty, I mean, maybe this is uh, not a popular view, but I think the difficulty in coming up with Asia specific standards or regional specific standards is that we lose sort of, you know, the integrity of global standards. And when you're looking at, you know, in, you know, large asset managers and large asset owners, it becomes very difficult to make, um, you know, it, it, it complicates, you know, sort of capital allocation decisions. 
Um, I think I think some of the frustration that you know that we've you know seen um, you know expressed uh, with sort of you know disclosures and how to sort of you know measure ESG and uh, risks and 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 also report against you know progress against certain metrics is we've seen the shift from obviously you know a decade ago from GRI towards SASB and then you know, and on the climate front to its TCFD. I think, you know, the, the launch of the ISSB standards at COP26 is a positive development. And, um, you know, we see more convergence of standards around that. And that actually does sort of, you know, aim to address the full spectrum of, um, you know, sustainability well beyond just climate. Um, and it's got sort of, you know, the buy-in of key players over there, you know, for a convergence of standards. So um, I've sort of um, put my hopes more in that direction than bespoke sort of, you know, Asia specific standards. Great, I see we have about five minutes left. Um, if you have any questions, please do drop them into the Q&A um, on the Zoom function. Uh, and speaking of which, I will go to one of those questions right now. Um, how effectively can technologies such as Project Greenprint initiated by the MAS provide visibility on compliance to ESG, especially in scope three? So, and what is the, as a follow-up, what is the responsibility of boards to nudge their companies onto such platforms when it's not a regulated compliance issue? Um, if you're not familiar with Project Greenprint, it's a collection of initiatives by the MAS that aims to harness technology and data to enable a more transparent, trusted and efficient ESG reporting. Um, platform or ecosystem. Um, Emmanuel, would you like to take that one first? I, I, must, I must say that on, on, on that specific issue, I would, I would need to get the assistance of my, my colleagues that are specialized in, in, in technology. So I don't have much to say from a legal okay. perspective in, in that issue, but maybe Rima and... I think very broadly, of course, technology has a big role to play in this, but the only, I think, word of caution here, what I've observed is a lot of the technology in the, the green space is still emerging. It's still yet to be tested. So I feel like a, a go-to strategy, uh, you know, a, a go-to technology would not probably be a good strategy it, for boards or for companies. Rather, I think a lot of this needs to be, it still remains to be tested out. So it, it, it would rather be about using a combination of, um, you know, the, the, with technologies that are out there, also understanding what their competitors are doing and what's worked for, for companies, their peer companies in the market, what's not worked and what's their experience has been. But I think that a lot of this is, is, is really evolving. So it's, it's a kind of, I mean, even when from, for both to nudge companies to, to adopt a particular kind of technology, it might be, might be a double-edged sword. I think there needs to be more thinking about, you know, where the gaps are also, what is the underlying information that is being captured through these uh, platforms and how credible is that really, um, you know, in terms of on-ground realities? So that would be my two cents to this. And, and, and mine is probably an adjacent cent or half cent. Um, but I think, you know, technology has a role to play in measuring scope three. I don't know that it's with a platform. It's more sort of being able to see how you can deploy uh, big data or, you know, IoT or, you know, other uh, other technologies to so understanding, I think, you know, the, the, the breadth of your supply chain and how to optimize that. Um, and, 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 you know, that takes us back to, again, you know, traceability and transparency and measuring scope three. Um, but that's slightly different to the question you asked about like a specific but even with scope three Aisha as you as you would know I mean the science to back up measurement of scope three is still quite weak I mean there is it a is. lot of debate in the academic circle in the scientific circle so even with like you know big words like big data you might come up with very sophisticated models so uh, and predicting certain scenarios but the thing is again what is the underlying information that goes into it and how credible is that that is being uh, that information that you're seeing on your screen so so, and I think yeah. that's, that's actually an even more acute problem here. I mean, what we've heard time and time again is getting, I mean, first of all, getting information or getting data on scope three is a challenge in and of itself, let alone reliable data. And what I think we're hearing more and more is that, you know, um, 
investors are setting almost time limits on, on their invested companies to demand this information of their customers and their vendors in the supply chain you know, before you know, contracts are up for renewal, et cetera. But, um, but you're absolutely right. It is, um, it's, it, it, it's a very patchy uh, area for data, um, you know, for data collection and verification. On that point, I think we are just about out of time. Thank you to our esteemed panelists, Rima, Emmanuel, and Aisha. I hope everyone found it a helpful, fruitful discussion. Um, thanks to the audience for your time. And before we go, I'm going to hand it over to Victor for some final thoughts and a tease for what's coming next at the SICC. Thank you so much, Michael. And my, my thanks to Aisha, Rima, and Emmanuel for um, a, a great conversation. And my thanks to, to members of the audience for some great questions. I mean, it, it just strikes me that here we all are facing existential risks and we as a world can't agree on the standards. The data is often lacking or if it's available, we're not sure if it's credible. Um, so I guess the short conclusion is there's an awful lot for boards to focus on. And even I dare to say to worry about. Um, so it's, I thought this was a great session. And we, of course, we can cover the topic in its entire complexity in one session. But I think, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, you now know who to go to uh, if you have questions. Uh, the, the good folks at Brunswick, Control Risks, and Chairman and Sterling uh, are available to help. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, we're, we're sort of dividing ESG up uh, to try and keep it in manageable uh, components. And the S component, the social risks, we're going to try and handle in April, uh, date to be confirmed. And then the governance risks we will cover in um, uh, April or May, depending on everybody's availability. But we're, we're certainly focused this year on trying to help you navigate better. Uh, and that's very much the role of um, a business association and certainly of SICC. Um, in closing, I just want to say that if you found this useful or you didn't find it useful, please let us know because we're always trying to learn. Um, you can contact us at here to help at sicc.com.sg. We've got plenty of quality events coming up, many of them uh, in person, you will be glad to know. Uh, so do check out um, uh, our events calendar on our website um, and um, join those events that appeal to you. So from all of us here today, from the wonderful panel uh, and from my team, goodbye and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody.